Hey everybody, it's Joel from The Board Game Mechanics. Today I'm looking at Tapestry, the board game. For a quick second here, I'm gonna talk about video games though. I love racing games, I just do. It's my favorite kind of video game. And I actually have this Oculus Rift here and a force feedback wheel so that I can play like games like Project Cars in really immersive modes where it feels like I'm in the stock car and it's a super good simulation. I play for an hour or two and I'm beat. Like it wears me out, but it's a lot of fun. It really is a lot of fun. You know what I play more than that though? I get to switch out and play Mario Kart like a lot. So I think maybe you're gonna get where I'm going with this um, if you know anything about this game. But if you don't, like I'll explain it here in a little bit. First, we're gonna go to the table and we're gonna talk about how Tapestry works and then we'll come back and we'll get some final thoughts. Uh, also, real quick before we go there, maybe sub, maybe give us a thumb. Um, we really do appreciate you guys as our fans and we really do consider fans friends. So if you haven't figured out a way to connect with us over on social media, maybe do that. Also, we can connect here, leave a comment, whatever. So, hey, thank you if you're a fan. Uh, man, you really are a friend. So, okay, anyway, enough enough of that like commercial for our own brand here. We're gonna move right on and get to the table now. Tapestry, let's get into setup to start with here. Uh, with setup, we're going to put out the main tapestry board, uh, which is a really nice looking board and it has these really cool rounded corners that I really appreciate and like. So it's gonna set out there. Make sure that you put the side up with the number of players that you have. So I have the one to three player side up right now because I'm gonna be setting up a two player game. One side of the tapestry board here has these icons and these icons indicate there's gonna be stacks of cards next to it. These are tech cards. We shuffle them up, we put them face down in that pile there, and then we put out three cards face up. Tapestry cards we just shuffle up and they stand right there. So we take care of that. There are two types of discovery tiles. Uh, these are hexes that are gonna be flipped over and put onto the board uh, over time. The smaller ones are just regular hexes that would go onto the map. The larger ones are space exploration hexes. There are many more of the small hexes in this game uh, so there's a big supply of those. There's not near as many space uh, hexes. So those are a higher level thing that you aren't going to do near as often. And there's a good chance you could run out of those actually if people really went heavily onto that track. These hexes, the smaller ones show just basic terrestrial geo, uh, geo forms. The larger ones show like, you know, uh, planetary exploration type things. They have a type of benefit you get, uh, when those are discovered. Um, Explored, I guess, is a better word, maybe. But uh, really a big part of this game. And you can see that these space tiles give you quite a bit more. This gives you two resources and eight victory points. Well, these just give you one resource. So we're not going to do near as much in space as we are on the terrestrial Earth. Um, but those tiles are a big part of the game as well. If there's a landmark in the game tapestry, it is this landmark board and all these really cool painted landmarks. Uh, these have a lot of table presence. They really do create something pretty cool to play with. Um, I like the quality of these. I like that they're painted. I think he made a great choice to do this because it really does add to your overall experience in the game. And I, I personally, uh, I think if there were an option to pay the extra money or not to get the painted miniatures, I would pay because they're really well painted. Um, but they sit on this mat. They show their footprint underneath them. So basically how much space they're going to take up in your capital. And they go on, on basically different corresponding spots that relate to where they're going to be unlocked on different tracks. There are some that don't go on the mat. Those cards, those are card driven landmarks. They're going to be unlocked once we uh, develop certain cards in our technology trees. So um, not even really trees, technology cards. So the landmarks are very cool and a big part of this game. We're going to get those placed out now. There's a 12 sided die for science. That's going to be rolled pretty frequently when going up the science track. Um, it's going to show how science influences other parts of our culture. That scientific development can help us in technology. They can help us with exploration. It can help us with military. It's kind of the thematic thing, but it's going to help us move up other tracks at low to no cost. There are also the conquest die. These die indicate that there are spoils when you have wars. And so you roll these when you when you conquer something. 
uh, and they're going to give you a choice of a benefit that you're going to get, either some points or some kind of resource. Um, another really powerful part of this game. So when people talk about tapestry, they often talk about this big stack of civilizations that we have available to us and these uh, little like capital maps that we also have. Um, we're going to select some of those. Um, basically, every one of them plays very different. And the little capital cities also have different patterns. They feel really balanced as far as the capital cities go. Some of the factions certainly play easier than others. And I think what will end up happening over the course of time with this game is there will be tier lists. Like probably fan created tier lists that say these are the easy factions, these are the hard factions, these are the powerful ones, these are the not as powerful ones. But I would guess that when expansion happens on this game, and I certainly guess expansion will happen on this game, it will be with tapestry cards and more civilizations coming out. Uh, but there's a bunch of civilizations. We're going to pick some of those. Where There's a bunch of capital capital maps, basically. We're going to pick those, and then we're going to set up our play area. There are basically three components that go into our civilization's play area. We have our civilization map. That's going to indicate what civilization we have, what kind of powers they, they develop, or what makes them unique from the other people in this game. We have our income map. This is going to show the kinds of income we get. Uh, and they're going to be able to keep track of like how many resources we have. And then we have our capital city mat, which our capital city mat is going to be what is used uh, to to like show how our city is mapped out. And it's going to be a way we score points and get some additional resources. Let's take a look at our capital city mat real quick here. This is basically a map of what our capital is going to look like when we're when we're developing our civilization. There are some dots on here. Those dots indicate that there are places where we can't build because there's swampy land or it's impassable land or whatever you want to say. Um, but we can't develop on those. And that's a positive and a negative because we want to fill these areas up to get resources and fill up rows and columns to get points. Well, these dots are considered filled. So there's some spots where we right off the bat are going to be able to get resources pretty quickly. So for example, when I put three things in this little area here, I'm going to get a extra resource really quickly. Um, so this would be a good place to start developing really. Um, so it's a positive and a negative. Uh, the negative is that sometimes you can't find spots to really fit some of those bigger like landmark buildings in there without having them hang off the edge of your city. So um, expanding beyond your, your typical grid, which isn't going to help you much for scoring or getting resources um, or not as optimally as it might otherwise. So you really have to do some planning with this, especially with those dot patterns and really study that when you start the game to understand there's a, definitely a spatial element in this game. Um, so that's worth taking a look at for sure. Also, your civilization has a bunch of text down here. All the civilizations function in a different way. So the architects here, for example, they really are, are peculiar about how they want to make their capital city map look, but it's going to give you really great benefits. It's going to double how you score things. So they're a kind of hard faction to play, but the benefits they give you are so strong, they're worth it. So maybe a little more difficult one to play on your first play, but a really good one. And there's 16 other ones. Maybe I'll do a video someday going through all of them. Um, but for today, we're just doing a setup and general gameplay video. So um, all of them are very different too. They're not just like aesthetic changes or they're not just like slight player power kind of things. These are really, they make it so your game experience is very different every time. Um, there's some that have like a push your luck element. There's some that like allow you to invent things so much better. So all the parts of the game that we've gone over so far, all the different tracks, all the different technologies that we develop are all almost games unto themselves. And each civilization has a different way that it has you focus on certain parts of the game. So the civilization, you really want to read over that and make sure you understand what your civilization does and maybe even stop and think about what you're going to do this game for a few minutes before you get going even. Player setup really happens on this income board. So we're going to stick these houses on the top here to cover these spaces up, leaving one space on the end open. That's going to be our initial income that we can get. Um, as we take buildings off of here and put them into our capital city, it's going to uncover more icons. So our amount of income we can get throughout the game is going to increase. And that's why we really want to keep building because the more we can build, the more we're going to get stuff during our income phase. And the more stuff we get during our income phase, the more we can do the next round and prolong our amount of time between income phases. Um, the thing that I don't really hear people mentioning much in reviews, and I really want to put an emphasis on because it's such a neat little touch, 
Stonemaier Games has been doing some really innovative stuff with just the actual technology in board games. So for example, their directions now are all printed on like what feels like plastic. There's not the paper anymore in there. It's like a like linen-y, plastic-y kind of finish. These player mats, though thin, are like plastic-y coated too. They feel like a very fine sandpaper almost. And then these pieces here, I mean, I'm gonna shake that pretty well. They stay on there. I mean, it's because they, it's almost like they Velcro down or something. I mean, that's, it's, that's an exaggeration for sure, but they just, I mean, they just stay on there really well. They don't slide. You have to really pick them up and put them back on. And it's a really neat way to do things. And I really like it. I think it works as well as if they had recessed boards and it probably saved them a bunch of money. And it works really honestly, just about as well. It's also critical for that, for that, city uh, capital mat because then your stuff's going to stay put like you really have to bump stuff to move it so i think that's really neat and then these things that need to slide are made of a different material like a smoother material so they slide on this really well well at least one side of them does there's a side that slides much better than the other i think because of the mold marks but they do slide really well so the the surface of these these mats i think is a little detail that i don't want to make an oversight of because it really does add to the gameplay that your mat, you don't have to worry about keeping things lined up as much as you would otherwise if it were like that smooth stuff and wooden cubes. So I think the components in this game, I think they did a good job on it, really. Um, and it was practical to do it this way. But anyway, when we set up, we put the houses on there. We put this our four types of, of basic um, goods into the zero space. And then we're ready to start. While we're here at the income board, I'm going to show that we start off with an income turn. And there's little tiny numbers there. I'm not sure if you guys can see those or not, but those little tiny numbers are there to remind us that, hey, make sure you do these steps in these rounds. So in round one, we aren't gonna put down a tapestry card because we already have the maker of fire down there. Um, but we're gonna do uh, the income step for sure. And so that's where we're gonna look at what kind of income is up on the top part of the board there. We have one of each of these kinds of income that we're gonna take. So. Uh, on my income track, I'm going to take income for that and slide it up one spot. Also, when I take that first income phase, I was able to get a couple other things too, including a hex tile, as indicated here, and a tapestry card. So, let's get right into the gameplay now. So, before we get into gameplay, I think this is worth mentioning that right here, these are the rules. No staples. Front, back, front, back. One, one sheet of paper. So it's not a complicated game to learn. Uh, it's actually quite simple. And that doesn't mean that it's not interesting. It doesn't have interesting choices in it. It just means that the basic core mechanics of this game are really simple. And that means accessibility. And I'll get more into this in my final thoughts, but that's a positive thing in my opinion. We're going to start the game with an income turn, which is... is this little area here, and it's useful that we have this little guide because it has these really small numbers here next to it, but you can you can see which one of these faces is gonna happen in which income turn. So we know that we aren't gonna use tapestry cards in the fifth one, and we know that we are only gonna collect income in the first one. And so when we collect income, we're gonna look at our income board, and we're gonna determine how much income we get. One of the clever things about this game is that our income is gonna increase as we're developing our society. It's it's pretty thematic that the more you develop your society, the more you develop your capital, the more that these little buildings are gonna come off, the more icons we're gonna to expose to get more income. And this is a concept that's familiar to us who've played things like Terra Mystica or Clans of Caledonia, but it's really well done in this game. And the first income phase, all I'm gonna get is I'm gonna get a, a currency, uh, the, the science icon, a food, and a culture. So I would move these up on that track. But as we look a little closer on this track here, you can see that I also get a tile that's depicted as being a face down tile and a card with a green back on it. So I get a tapestry card and I get a tile. And even though the tile icon shows a tile face down, I'm actually gonna leave that face up in front of me because I am just ready to put that out on the map at this point. Uh, it's not on the map. That's why it shows the face down. It goes into my play area. But then later when I do exploration, that's that's going to be able to go on the board. So 
all that's my first income phase. What we use that income for is to advance our civilization along these development tracks. So as I'm playing the game on my turn, most of the time I'm going to take an advancement action. Sometimes I'm going to take an income action. So income actions, we'll talk about one last time here uh, in a minute. But that's basically what I just did, just a very minor version of it. A majority of the game is going to be me taking, you know, advancements along these tracks. So this is the exploration track, which is where I'm going to manipulate tiles on the board and be able to put some tiles out and, and show that I'm exploring the world. And when I, when I want to advance on the track, what I do is I pay the cost up here indicated. This shows me that I can pay any type of resource and move up after I've paid the cost. Then I get the benefit up here at the top. That's a mandatory benefit. So I would have to take two tiles, put them into my play area. However, this spot here shows a optional bonus. So I don't have to pay this additional resource to get another tapestry card. And to be honest, I'm used to always taking bonuses in most games. This game, I found that taking the bonus isn't always in your best interest. Because if you already have tapestry cards, especially early on, resources are so tight that you may not want to take that. But you do have to take the place place the, the uh, tile out at this point. Sometimes there's a slash between the icons. That means do, do one or the other. As we keep going up, there's different tiers. So we can see this one and this two here. Uh, as we get through the tier one advancements, we're going to hit the tier two advancements. And the tier two advancements are basically going to just cost us a little more because we have to pay a slightly higher cost. But we're going to get this benefit here that's brand new, uh, a landmark. So if that landmark is still available on the landmarks board because I'm the first player to get through there, I get to take that out and put it onto my onto my player board, which is another little part of this game too. Completing completing our capital is a big part of this game. Um, but we can continue going. There's there's four tiers on each of these tracks. The exploration track here, basically about how you're going to manipulate tiles onto the board, putting tiles onto the board, and then later more advanced how we're going to explore space with some minimal uh, or not minimal, I guess just some putting out these these brown houses. The technology track, same idea, we're paying resources, getting benefits, but they're working more with these yellow thatched roof buildings and technology cards. And technology cards are a really neat way for you to get like kind of a side player power or side benefits that aren't on the main board. Also, we have a different landmark here, um, the different tiers, and this one uses a slightly different resources. This one uses currency in order for us to develop it. This is probably as good a time as any to look at technology cards. Technology cards are going to be little benefits that we get uh, based on what's in these icons here. So there's a circle and a square. And if we look here, there's an X, a circle, and a square. So as we develop these technologies in our civilization, they're going to give us certain benefits. For example, the light bulb. When we first develop the light bulb, it's going to go to the circle level. And we're going to get a, a currency. Then later, as we develop the light bulb more, it's going to develop a, a building onto our capital for us. The development usually happens uh, either by doing actions on the technology track, but there's also a development that happens when you take income. So as a part of income, you can advance these technologies over the course of a game. There's also times where you're going to wipe all your technologies out and start developing new ones. So it's really kind of a like little mini game that you're balancing. How quickly can I get these technologies up before they wipe out? Because it's the same track that wipes the technologies out that advances the technologies. Um, the square icons tend to be more powerful because they do take two turns to get up, but they also have a prerequisite. So this little like indication down here says you or your neighbors is what that means, must have writing in order to make the library at the square level. Writing is one of the things presented on the board on the income track. So those prerequisites are sometimes a little bit painful, but a part of what you have to do to develop your technology. The exploration track allowed us to put tiles onto the board and explore the map, expose more of the world. The military track is going to allow us to conquer and, and, and take over those territories. So when this happens, we're basically going to see this icon here. We're going to put one of our, our pieces onto the board. Combat in this game is just as minimal as possible as far as mechanics go. Um, you basically are able to topple people and just knock their towers over. There's not a bunch of dice rolling. There's not a bunch of power calculations. It's very streamlined, very lightweight. And so people who are hoping for a combat game, this one's probably not it. 
And that could be why we're seeing some mixed reviews on this, to be honest. We're also going to be able to put these red buildings out when we're on this track. So that's the two basic things that happen here. Um, we're using the culture icon in order to pay for the, the track here. And what that looks like is this. So when I do that conquest action, I'm going to put one of my game pieces out adjacent to my, my area. And then I'm going to roll these die and get the benefit presented on one of them. So this red die is primarily victory points, while the black die is primarily resources. This, this icon here indicates that I could take whatever resource is present on that tile. But there's all kinds of resources on this. And the victory points on this, I know there's a seven side on there. There's also one that scores all your hexes that you have. So if you get heavy into this track, it's a good way to get a lot of points, um, especially if you can get a lot of hexes that are under your control and get that icon to pop for you. Science is maybe the most intriguing of the tracks to me, to be honest, because I, it just, it really is an interesting thing because what happens is you roll the science die when you advance as indicated by this icon. However, sometimes the icon does not have an X underneath it. Sometimes it does. If it has the X underneath it, that means you don't get to get any benefits associated with, with rolling that. You just get to advance on a track. Um, whereas if the X isn't present, then it gives you a lot of really good stuff. It has the tier system just like anything else in landmarks. But this is basically, I think, indicating that science impacts other parts of culture. So science, when we get developments, can help our military. Science can help our technology. Science can help our exploration. So when we roll the science die, we're going to roll this 12-sider. And then whichever side comes up, we get to take an advancement for free on that track. However, like I said, if it has the X underneath there, you don't get the benefits from it. If it, if look at that, that means I would get the benefit on that other track. So it's a way to move up on other tracks that becomes particularly powerful when you're only paying two resources and you can move up in the three tier, which costs three resources. Uh, so it's saving your resources sometimes, but then also when you get to the end of this track, you get a really nice chance to score quite a bit of points. Um, it does help just buff up the other, other tracks though. The income phase needs another closer look really for us to be fair to this game and give it its full treatment because as the game develops, we're going to do more with our income. So the income, there's a little cheat sheet icon there. Here are the four basic phases of, of the income turn. We're going to activate our culture, our civilization's powers if possible. We're going to play a tapestry card, which are these cards over here to the side. Then this is going to say we're going to optionally upgrade one of our technologies. We kind of talked about that earlier, so slide, slide a card up because as time passes, we're going to develop that technology. Also, score all the icons that indicate scoring on the, uh, on the scoring track up there. And then, or not the scoring track, the income tracks where the houses are sitting at. And then finally, the income phase where we're going to get the goods that are exposed underneath those houses uh, throughout the game, getting more and more income all the time. So these tracks are going to indicate what we get benefit wise. This is going to show that we get two, two of that type of currency, uh, three of the science type, two food, two culture. We're also going to get a hex that goes into our player area, a tapestry card, and we're going to be able to score some things. With the laurels around it, it shows that we're going to score our tech cards. We're going to score our capital. We are going to get just four victory points there. And then we would get for all of our hexes that have our, our marker upright in it, we would have scored as well. Uh, so the final thing I think we really need to cover in this is scoring the capital. So our, our capital is a nine by nine grid with nine by nine grids inside of those little grid boxes. And so what's going to happen is when we score our capital, every column and every row is going to score us points. Um, and I know that that is changed and modified, at least with one civilization, the, the uh, architects. They like to have things match and they can get extra points even. So um, sometimes your civilization can impact things like how you score your, your capital. And so it's important that you pay attention to your civilization throughout the game. But on this one, we're just going to do the most basic scoring. We have a couple columns filled in just based on how these dots count as free spaces. So these two columns would be filled in. We've got landmarks taking up some space up there and then these little houses filling in here. And we'd have two columns or two rows this way filled in. So every time we scored our capital city at this stage of the game, we're going to get four points. We would have scored the capital twice in that last round because there were two of that icon exposed. So eight points for developing your city like this. They're actually doing a pretty good job, this player. And they might actually, by the end of the game, fill in a couple more rows yet. So they're really getting some good points at the end of the game. Um, the landmarks are critical for getting a lot of real estate covered. But you can't, no matter what, you can't build on these dots. So sometimes it's possible you may have to build off the edge of the map like that to get something to fit. Um, 
The other piece too is when you fill in a little a little sub cluster nine by nine there uh, entirely like this one is, you would be able to get a free resource by doing that. So the capitals are a really cool spatial element to this game. I'm not typically a fan of games like Indian Summer or Baron Park where you have to manipulate shapes and fill things in, but it's kind of a fun city planning type theme with this and it's really pretty fun. Um, it's just basically putting these things down and a majority of what you're putting down are going to just be one square little buildings and then you're going to be putting down some other bigger things. Some of the things get pretty large that you put on here. So, I mean, some things are going to take up just a lot of real estate. Like this one would be very difficult to stick on there. I'd have to stick it probably like that in order to fill it in there. So, um, just a very, very cool little part of the game that is going to add to the overall experience. So this is kind of a rules overview, not really even a rules explanation. Let's get back into the studio. We'll get some final thoughts now. So what does any of that have to do with Mario Kart or Project Cars? Well, let's let's dive into this and maybe a little, it'll clear up a little bit here. Uh, let's get to my ratings first, I guess, on this. Um, here are my positives. The components in this game are second to none. I mean, like, they're just amazing components. For just it being a regular edition of a game, not some deluxe limited edition Kickstarter thing or something like that, the components in this game are really, really good. And I think Jamie Stegmaier said it cost 10 bucks to make the miniatures painted in this game. I think that 10 bucks is well worth it because for me, someone who's painted miniatures before, it would have taken me 20 hours to do that. And I don't know that I would have turned out, they would have turned out maybe as well as they did. So uh, I would, as I would like super gladly pay that 50 cents per hour of my, of my time towards having someone else do it better than me. So I am really okay with that. Um, I think that the price point on this game isn't ridiculous by any means. I think that you get a lot in this game. Uh, it is expensive, but I think there's just a lot there. So the component quality is really top notch, even for a game with this price point. The player boards are thin, but they're like plastic and they've got this like sandpaper texture to them that I mentioned in the in the playthrough. Um, and then the, the huts and things are like this softer plastic, almost rubbery plastic that just sticks to it almost. And so like when you bump your player board, it things don't fly. I mean, you obviously can't like swing the thing around the, the table or something, but it's very bump proof. And it, I like the technology they've used in this. And I hope that they continue doing it. Like Stegmeier's made some really cool industry-wide improvements to, to how we do board games. And I mean, like I'm talking like that linen finished plastic that we use for, for rule books in their games and the game trays being standard issue in more of their new games. So I think that there's some really cool things they're doing with their games to make them heirloom type games that we're going to keep around for a while and use. So I think this game's the same way. I think this game's like an heirloom type game that we're going to keep and play for a long time. Um, so anyway... Back to the positives, it's really easy to teach, it's really easy to learn. And another component in this game that's really important, and I think it's worth mentioning, is the um, like it's the descriptors of the different spots. So there's a sheet in there that just shows like what every spot does. It, it shows the icons and then it tells what it does. So for brand new players, the first time through or two, like they're gonna have that sheet in their hand, they're gonna be able to go, oh, okay, I get what that does. And then the icons are really easy to understand once they click. So I, I don't think it's necessary for players who played this a couple times, but it's really awesome to have that available to people who don't understand what the icons mean yet. So I really do like that. And, and it's like inventions are kind of explained on it as well. It's a really awesome player aid and it makes this game so accessible, like so very accessible. This is a game that I think that you could play with family members who played board games even, like at family get togethers kind of thing. This isn't like your, your normal Civ games. If we, wanna, if we wanna try and compare this to Civ games, there's no way you're breaking this game out at Thanksgiving with like, you know, your aunts and uncles, unless you've got a really cool family that plays Civ games. But at any rate, uh, like a typical family could play this game at, at Thanksgiving, I think probably if they played Ticket to Ride or some of the little things like that. So it's super accessible, super easy to teach. Um, and it's such an interesting puzzle. It's such an interesting decision making kind of engine building. Uh, I don't know how to compare this game to anything else. I mean, it's not like other Civ builders. There's kind of tech trees on it, but it's really more like you're building an engine of resource generation by going up these trees and making choices to decide what's the best for you in your particular time and space. I, I, it's just a really cool set of mechanics that go together. And it and it's not light, light, but it's certainly not heavy. So I, I don't know. It's it's just a really cool combination of mechanics and, and interesting decision-making and puzzle type stuff for sure. Uh, the factions and civilizations in this game, 100% make this game feel different. So like one faction, for example, the architects, you really get concerned about your capital city, little map board thing there. You get really concerned about it. You, you really wanna make sure 100% that you're you're developing that space efficiently, that you're matching things up as best you can and just doing a great job with that. 
Uh, whereas with other factions, you don't care about that as much because there's other things they do better. There's some factions that are just this total like luck fest, have fun playing this little mini game of gambling. Like I'm going to roll these die and get a lot of resources or move up tracks. Um, so I, I don't know. I think it's really cool that these different factions, which feel pretty well balanced, to be honest. I mean, I think I said there'll be a tier list eventually at some point, And I think there will. There'll be like, these are the easy ones. These are the medium ones. These are the hard ones. And these are the ones that are really powerful right now. And and I mean, like, I think that that's okay. I, I think that they're close enough, though, that like they're fun to play. Um, and then the other piece, too, is like people complain a lot about the tapestry cards in this game, that they are really swingy and they make the game go widely one way or the other. I, I haven't experienced it in a bizarrely like wide like someone rallied 40 points behind from behind because of one tapestry card kind of thing i mean i'm i could see where it could be possible i just haven't personally experienced it um and then even then like my mario kart analogy like that game's super fun but part of the fun on it is you never know if you're gonna win until you cross the finish line and it's because things like those blue shells can like wipe you out and so like if you were a hardcore car sim enthusiast and there was a mechanic in the game that made you wreck like randomly based on someone else getting an item and then wiping you out, that would be absurd, right? But it's still fun in the setting of this arcade type game called Mario Kart. So this is the arcade civilization builder. This game's not that simulated, thick, crunchy game that people are used to when they, they hear the word Civ Builder. This is that fun, whimsical, play it and have fun and enjoy this puzzle. And it kind of feels like you're building a civilization, but man, you're just having fun. And you're enjoying the art and you're enjoying the components kind of game. So that's where the filter is that I have to put in there. Like, I'm not going to compare it to Through the Ages. I'm not going to compare it to Clash of Cultures. I mean, those games are great, but they're different. And you have to let this game be what it is. Okay? So if you get rid of your preconceived notions, I think that you really are going to enjoy this game. The last thing I have here is expandability. I, I can't see this game not getting expanded like a bunch because it has so much room for expansion in it. More factions, more tapestry cards, more inventions. So I think this is one we're going to see more on. Maybe sideboards? I, I don't know. Like, it's got a lot... The system itself has a lot of areas where I think you could expand this game. So I feel like we're going to see expansions. Maybe this can really get even better over time. So I really do enjoy this game. And I really do love Mario Kart. I love arcade racers. I love simulation racers. I love simulation games that sim simulate us building civilizations. But I really love this arcade version of it, too. This lighter, more fun whimsical version of a Civ Builder 4X type game. It's it's really good. It's it's pretty good. And so what I'm seeing right now in other reviews that I'm watching where people are being really critical of it, I just want to address that for a second. People are saying that. They're saying this isn't a Civ Building game. This isn't this thick, heavy simulation of building a civilization. Okay, that's, that's fine. It's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be an engine building puzzle game. That's what it is. And it has a Civ theme on it. And it does feel a little like you're doing something towards building a tribe up or something. But... It's not those games. It's just not. And so it's like, again, my analogy, it'd be like someone saying Mario Kart stinks because the graphics aren't realistic and go-karts can't zoom because they drive over arrows or I, I don't know. You know what I mean? So I think that the fact that this is like a lighter, more whimsical, fun version of a, a sim builder is perfectly okay. And I don't think we should compare it to other sim builders because we haven't had this lighter, more fun version of a sim builder. Maybe like Imperial Settlers or something even, but like, it's just a fun, light game. I mean, for, for what it does, for what the theme is and what it, what it mechanically is. So I think that we have to do that. The other piece too is I feel like there's like anti-hype hype with this game now. This game, Stonemaier Games and Jamie Stegmeier did a brilliant job releasing this game. They did a viral-ish marketing campaign for it. They released pictures of these awesome components. They didn't say a lot about gameplay. They leaked things for about a week and then they were like, boom, here's pre-orders. Here's the price. Here's this game coming out. Then they then they delivered this game like in three weeks. So that's unheard of in this world of board gaming where Kickstarters go on for a month and then things are changing with the production cycle and everything until the very day we get the game. I mean, like this has been a really pleasant surprise, I think, for us to see this game in our homes within a month of seeing first pictures of it kind of thing. So I think with that release of this game, it got a ton of hype. People were talking about it. It was out there. And so I think there's this anti-hype hype, like I said, where people are going, well, it's not the best game ever. So like, why are we talking about this thing like it is? I don't know that we are. We're just talking about it. We're enjoying it. It's a good game though, man. It's really a good game. So anyway, let's, let's, I get, let's get right to it. I guess let's put some numbers on it. Let's, let's wrap this thing up, I guess. Uh, I'm, 
I'm getting a little little angry, I guess. I don't know, maybe angry. I, it's just upsetting that people are kind of like so close-minded about this game already. Anyway, uh, the accessibility in this game, I put it at a family plus. I, I think that if you've played gateway games, if you've played a little bit of like some like worker placement maybe or something where you're building an engine at all, you're going to be able to play this. If you played Wingspan, you can play this one for sure. So um, another great Stone Mile game. Uh, so at any rate, the theme on this one, I don't think anyone's going to have a problem with this theme. I don't think we see gory, bloody genocide happening in this or anything like that. I mean, with this kind of Civ game, which you can see in some Civ games, not that it's like bloody, but like you can see like atrocities played out. And this one you don't. It's just like, oh, I'm in your hex now. We're going to tip your tower over. And that's the most conflict that we have in this game, really, to be honest. Um, so I think the theme is about for everybody. Um, the fun on this game is a five out of five. I'm going to give it a strong five out of five. And here's why. Okay. I played this game. I immediately wanted to reset it and play it again. And I did. And I played it again with my son who doesn't like games that much. Like he's not a huge game fan anymore. And he was like, yeah, let's play again. It's cool. So him to be this gripped and engaged by it, there's something there. And he later said it was a 10. It's his favorite game now. Not only that, but I played it a third time. I just set it up and I was like, I'm just going to go through these turns myself and kind of use this, this Automa and, and see how it plays on its own. And it's okay solo. It really is. But I mean, I was so interested in playing it. I wanted to play it again solo, which I'm not a solo gamer. So it captivated me enough that I wanted to play it a third time. Then I go to bed that night, okay? I dreamt of Tapestry. I had dreams about like, different expansions where if you fill your whole city, you got this like mat that was like an extra sideboard. Or I mean, like I had crazy bizarre dreams about it because it was this in my mind. And that means I had a lot of fun playing it, I think. So I'm giving it the five out of five. Uh, the replayability in this, every faction feels so different. I think you're going to get to play this game a lot. And then beyond that, like I said, those tapestry cards, there's a lot of them in there. You're going to see a bunch of different combinations coming out. I think we're going to see expansions too. So five out of five on the replayability without even an expansion. If an expansion never came out, this game's going to get a ton of play over a ton of time because it's just, it's good. The way how the tracks all interact with each other, it feels unique every time you play it. I mean, like, and I mean, I'm not a hundred plays into this game, but I'm enough plays in this game to know that it's not getting stale for me at all. Like I want to play it after this video is over. The design and the art, I already raved about this. It's a five out of five. It's like, seriously, it's a little expensive, but I think that you get such a great value even at that price for this game. Like the componentry in it is so good. Um, and it's, I, it is kind of expensive at a hundred bucks MSRP. That's not cheap. I mean, a hundred bucks is not a amount of money to throw away, but you get a lot in this box. And I think you're going to get a good value per play on this because of the high replayability. And you're really going to enjoy playing with the nice components in this game. So I, I think the value on it's really good um, overall, even though it is kind of a, a big purchase up front. And the design and the art in it, five out of five. So where does this one land at? Well, that's a five out of five. I mean, how could I give it anything but a five out of five if I'm rating every category five out of five? And I gave this one the caveat of, if you can accept this game for what it is, it's awesome. It's amazing. Like if you can just accept this game for what it is, it's a perfect game. Five out of five. I mean, I think it's fantastic. So not everyone's going to agree with me and that's okay. And, and it may not be for you. This is strictly my opinion. I love this game a lot. I love it a lot. And I avoided the hype as best I could so that I could try and go into this thing unbiased. And I still love it a ton. I think it's fantastic. I think that over time, we're going to see this one stick around. I just really think it's a good game. And I think it's it's just it's that Stonemaier quality of a game, you know? So really, really enjoy it. It's going to be like the equivalent of pop music. Like your edgy underground friends aren't going to be into this game, but I'm into it. Like, and I enjoy a good pop rock ballad from time to time. So anyway, I've enjoyed the board game mechanics and I like tapestry. I don't know. Keep gaming too, I guess. But I do. I like tapestry a lot. Like, I do. It's really good. All right, keep gaming. Keep gaming.